All right, today's scripture is Exodus 4, uh, Exodus 5, I'm sorry, 1 through 3, three. Yeah. and then Exodus 6, 1 through 9. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But, my name, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with my mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Valerie. <clears throat> All right, it took us four weeks to get through chapter four. So now in this sermon, we're going to go, uh, we're going to do the next six chapters, right? The Titans don't play till next week. Y'all got nothing to do this afternoon. And I'm totally joking, don't worry. But we are going to go all the way through as we look at the ten plagues this morning. Uh, now, because we're going to ask ourselves, what do the ten plagues reveal to us about who God is and how God works in the world. Uh, many of us maybe are familiar with the Ten Plagues. Maybe that was some of the, uh, the stories you uh, heard as a kid, you learned about and, and read about, uh, which I wonder if that's the case, why we teach those to kids, because they're pretty wild when you think about it. I mean, when you stop and think about what actually happened, the Ten Plagues, or what they're also sometimes known as, the Ten Strikes Against Egypt, uh, are pretty difficult to wrap our minds around. And it makes me, this whole week I've been wondering and asking, what, what is God's actions through the plagues? Through these plagues that themselves bring so much death and destruction to so many people and animals and the environment. I mean, what do these things teach us and show us about God? And one of the conclusions I had as I was thinking about this is that it depends Really, what we get from this depends on our perspective and, and kind of where we're looking at these from. Because uh, perspective is so important, right? I was watching, I was celebrating my own personal national holiday yesterday, which was the start of college football. And uh, I was watching, you know, it's amazing how you can be watching in the same game and see uh, two very different perspectives. I was watching uh, the, the Florida-Miami game, sorry, Caleb, and uh, I was just imagining on one sideline, it was looks of just absolute disgust and just like, I can't believe this is happening. And yet in the same game on the other sideline, triumphant, right? It was like, this is the best day ever. And yet it, was, it all mattered what perspective you had. And as we look at the 10 plagues, it's the same thing. What does the 10 plagues teach us about God if you were the Israelites? If you're one of the people that has been enslaved, and how does that look very different uh, depending on whether you are the Israelites or if you are Pharaoh and the Egyptians? 
So we're going to start out again by asking this one important question. First of all, why does God have the plagues at all in the first place? Right? Why, why have the plagues? If, if God's goal is to liberate the Israelites and free them from slavery, why doesn't he do it in a very quick, decisive way? Right? Why, why go through all of these, this big event uh, when the goal is to liberate the Israelites? Why could God not have found some way to sneak them out the back door, so to speak, and, and escape much more quickly? And why ten plagues? Right? God, could you not do it in four plagues or three plagues or one plague? Why not just have the, the, the tenth plague at the very beginning? To answer this, let's look at our verses from chapter 6 this morning. Uh, we're going to start in reverse order. We'll look at chapter 6, and then we'll go back to chapter 5. But as we look at chapter 6 of those verses, uh, we see that Moses and Aaron have just come from their initial encounter with Pharaoh, and it didn't go well for them. Pharaoh basically laughed in their faces and then decided to increase the workload of the Israelites. He said to them, look, you guys are coming here and causing all this trouble. It's because the Israelites are lazy. It's because they don't have enough to do. And so what does he do? He increases their workload even more. And he tells them, you've got to do more, and you've got to do more with less. I'm not even going to give you the supplies you need. And then when you don't do what you're supposed to, you're going to get punished for it. Pharaoh blames them for their problems. This, of course, makes the Israelites then come to Moses and Aaron and say, wait, what are you guys doing to me? What are you guys doing to us? We, we want freedom, yes, but you guys are coming in here making our lives so much worse. And so you can imagine, Moses and Aaron at this point are discouraged. And so in our verses in chapter 6, God comes to Moses and Aaron to encourage them. He reminds them of their story, that you all and the Israelites are a covenant people. That I, God, have made a, a covenant, a promise. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you all. And that you're going to have a land of your own one day. And then God reminds them there in verses 6 and 7. He says to them, Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, which are the plagues. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. You shall know that I am your God. Notice again, in verse 6, those plagues are called great acts of judgment. In other places in, this, in these chapters, they're called signs and wonders. God's going to do signs and wonders before the Egyptians and the Israelites. Now what's a sign? Right? A sign is something that points to something else. God is saying, when you see these plagues, they're going to point to something else for you to focus on. And second, again, I want to highlight that verse 7. God says to them, I'm doing this so that you will know who I am. You will know who I am. This tells us something, that God's goal when he freed the Israelites wasn't just to liberate them from slavery. It was so that they would know who God is. That they would know what kind of God that they are called to to be in relationship with, and what kind of God they are worshiping. That is so important. They, God is doing all this so the Israelites will know. But not just the Israelites. They aren't the only ones that God wants to know Him. And to that, let's go back to chapter 5 and our scripture there. Again, our scripture in chapter 5 is when Moses and Aaron first come to Pharaoh and they have this conversation where they tell him, hey, God is calling you, Yahweh is calling you to let His people go. And notice what Pharaoh's attitude is. Pharaoh says to them, Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should listen to him and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Remember, Pharaoh in this day, he, was, he himself was considered a god in his religion and his country. He was, he was considered a god, and he has this mindset. Wait a minute. Who is this rival God who's showing up that, has, that thinks that I, they have a power and authority over me? Do you not know who I am? Who is this God that has the right to command me or to determine what is good and evil for me or what is right and wrong for me in my life? 
Who is this God who thinks he can just come in, waltz in here, and tell me what to do? See, Pharaoh's issue, he wasn't, he wasn't, his primary concern wasn't losing his labor force. That was part of it. His primary concern was that there's this rival God here who thinks that he can come in and challenge my authority and my power. Friends, is this not the same attitude that we can sometimes struggle with? Who is this God that can come in and think that he can tell me what to do with my life, who, to, who can decide for me what is right and wrong, good and evil? Is this not what the world tells us? Wait, there, the world says, who is God? I, will, I do not know this God, and I will not listen to God for my life. Same, same way, the God says the same thing. Who is this Jesus? I don't know Jesus, and, and who is Jesus to tell me what's right or wrong, good and evil? to tell me how to live my life. See, I think that Pharaoh's mindset isn't just the mindset of Pharaoh back then. If we're honest, if I'm honest, I can have that same kind of mindset too sometimes. The, why doesn't God release the Israelites quickly, over, overnight, and decisively? Why go through all of this? Because God wants to make a resounding statement about who He is and His character, not just to the Israelites, but to this Pharaoh who considers himself a God. And not just a Pharaoh. God wants us to make that same statement to you and me today, here and now. Again, a quick rundown of the plagues. The first plague, uh, turning the Nile into blood in Exodus 7, 17, God says, by this you will know that I am Yahweh. The second plague, frogs everywhere. In Exodus 8.10, God says, I'm doing this so that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh. The fourth plague, the flies in chapter 8, so that you will know that I, Yahweh, am in this land. In the seventh plague, twice in that plague, and, and two times in chapter 9, God says, I'm doing this so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. And so that you would know that the earth belongs to Yahweh, belongs to me. The eighth plague in Exodus 10 of locusts, so that you may know that I'm Yahweh. And then finally, in the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, before it happens, God says, I'm doing this so that you will know that Yahweh makes a distinction between Israel and Egypt. Every single plague, almost, that this happens, again, it's the same chorus. I'm doing this so you'll know. I'm doing this so you'll know. And, and to the very end, right before that final plague, God says, I'm going to multiply my signs and wonders so that you get the picture uh, loud and clear for, for all, all of you. And again, uh, the question then that we have to wrestle is, if the plagues are about us knowing God, about the Israelites knowing who God is, and the Egyptians knowing who God is, and us knowing who God is, what do they tell us about God? What do they tell us about who Yahweh is? And this is where the answer to that question is the one that's a matter of perspective. Which perspective are you looking from? And to begin, let's start with Pharaoh and his hard heart. If you know the story, many of us know how uh, repeatedly one of the things in this story is Pharaoh and his hard heart. Heart. When God initially shows up to talk to Moses, he says in Exodus 3, he says, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go except by a mighty hand. I know that God's not, he says, I know that Pharaoh's not going to let the people go except by a mighty hand. And then we read that in chapter 3, but then in Exodus chapter 7, uh, right before the first plague, we hear God say to Moses, You shall speak all that I command you. And your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. So wait a minute, wait a minute. Does God know what's going on in Pharaoh's heart? Or, wait, is, or is God doing the hardening of Pharaoh's heart? Which one is it? Is Pharaoh's stubborn, resolute commitment to his path of resisting God, is that of his own doing? Or is God doing that? Well, it seems to me as I read this that God's initial statement that he knows what's going on with Pharaoh is a statement of God's foreknowledge. That God alone is the one who looks into our heart and sees what's at work there. Who sees what the motivations are, who sees what's happening within us. 
And what God is saying to Moses and Aaron is that, hey, I've looked into Pharaoh's heart. This, this stuff that's been happening, this is not like, this has been going on a while. This is not something that came out of nowhere. He's looked into his heart and he's seen Pharaoh's commitment to maintaining his own power at all costs. He's looked in and seen this resolute determination to get his way. He's seen Pharaoh's unwillingness to listen to God or anyone else. Or maybe he's looked in and seen that Pharaoh is a, is a captive of his own fear, as we talked about in an earlier message. Once again, to me, God's initial statement is about what God already sees within and not about God forcing Pharaoh to be hard-hearted, at least not initially. Uh, if you were to look closely at a reading of all those references of the hard heart of Pharaoh, it says a couple different things. It talks about how, one, it talks about how Pharaoh hardened his own heart, uh, like it does in Exodus chapter 8. Or two, it talks about how the, the, the text is kind of ambivalent. It's unclear. It says that Pharaoh's heart was hard, uh, like it does in chapter 7. Thirdly, it does say that God does harden Pharaoh's heart. Those three things. And if you were to read close, what you would notice is that in the first five plagues, either Pharaoh hardens his own heart or his heart was hard. That's what it says. In the first five plagues, it says that. And in the last five plagues, we read that mostly, for the most part, God is the one who hardens Pharaoh's heart. It's almost like there's this clear distinction between the first five in the last five, it's almost as if God gave Pharaoh chance after chance after chance to wake up and to see the destruction that his actions were causing. But each time Pharaoh folded his arms and said, mm, who is Yahweh? I don't have to listen to Yahweh. And so it's almost as if that, that finally, when it got to a point where Pharaoh wouldn't take no for an answer, that God said, you know what, if this is what you want, I'm going to even use your hard heart to accomplish my purposes through. And God continued to guide Pharaoh down the path that Pharaoh himself chose. It's kind of like parents, uh, if you remember or if you had, had kids, you know, you tell your, your, your kid, you know, it's cold outside. You need to put on a coat, right? You need to put on a coat. And they're like, nah, I'm good. I got this. I'm fine. And you're like, you need to put on a coat. It's cold outside. It's cold. And you say that time after time after time until eventually you're just like, you know what? Fine, if you don't want to put on a coat, we're not going to put on a coat. We're going to walk outside and we're going to see what happens, right? Like that's, when I read this story, that's almost how I read it. See, God knew that Pharaoh would resist, but he still gave him many chances to turn. And eventually Pharaoh's evil reached this point of no return, and God then bended Pharaoh's evil will to his own purposes and to lure Pharaoh into his own destruction. See, we have to understand that, that while God is a loving, forgiving, merciful, gracious God, God does not and will not ever tolerate sin. God does not and he will not ever tolerate sin in our lives. Not because God's some big cosmic bully. No, because God knows that sin is deadly to us. It's deadly to our relationships and it's deadly to the people around us. How many of Pharaoh's people were just innocent bystander people that got caught up in what he was doing and suffered for it? How many of the people in our lives are suffering because there's sin in our life that we have compromised with or we have not been willing to let go of, that we have minimized in some way? That what, what we see in the story is that when we see a person consistently choosing evil, especially evil like this, evil that looks like enslaving and abusing others, ripping infants from their mother's arms and drowning them, and consistently ignoring God's warnings. We see that God is a merciful God, absolutely. But God will not let sin and evil do damage forever. He will not do it, because God is a God of justice at the same time. And while, I do not, and while I do think that this confrontation with Pharaoh is, is kind of a unique one, Pharaoh uh, uniquely was in a position unlike any of us will ever be in, I think there, is, there are some of us this morning here that when we read this story and we see Pharaoh's hard heart, that we need to be shaken to our core. 
then maybe we can look into our own lives and see that Pharaoh, that attitude of Pharaoh, can live within each of us if we're not careful. In fact, thinking about Pharaoh this week, it, it, it reminded me of thinking about the parable of the sower. We were talking about that on, on Tuesday night. And in the parable of the sower, you see Jesus talk about how some of the seed that the sower uh, sowed or threw it fell on the path. Right? What is the path other than a heart that has been hardened over time? A heart that is calloused and closed off. And it got me thinking, how, how does a callous form in our life? How does a path, how does a path become a path? Does a callous not form when we, it's from repeated action in our lives? Does a path not form when we walk down the same path again and again and again until it becomes hard and well-worn? You see, I, we, we develop calluses on our bodies through repeated actions. We develop paths in life through repeated paths. We develop paths and calluses in our heart through repeated attitudes and actions that we won't let go of. We walk down paths again and again and again, and before long, our heart becomes closed and hardened from it. I think about some of the, the research uh, that have been done over on things like addiction and things like that about how in our minds, our minds are an incredible thing, and how God has wired our minds to develop new neural pathways all the time. But when it comes to addiction, that's walking down the same path again and again and again until it becomes almost a super highway in our, in our brains, that our neurons are literally wire us to go down that path again and again. The good news is that can be broken and relearned, but it is incredibly difficult incredibly difficult and won't just happen on its own usually major things have to happen in life i think about how many funerals i've done and how usually there comes a point and whenever i'm sitting with a couple uh, oftentimes and they say you know so and so is just so stubborn right and we kind of laugh it off a little bit like make it you know make it like it's not a big deal like you know everybody's kind of stubborn and that's true to an extent but stubbornness is not necessarily a good thing for many of us when especially when it comes to sin and what we see in our text this morning, I mean, e even in that verse 3 of chapter 5, the Israelites say to Pharaoh, look, if we don't go, God might, be, God might bring a pestilence on us. He might do this to us. In other words, look, God's not playing favorites here. And what the Israelites discover, that when they become like Egypt later in their history, you know what God does? He does bring those same things on them just as he does to the Egyptians. Again, one of the things, one of the messages we should take from the ten plagues is that God is a God of justice who does not let sin slide. I just heard Johnny Cash singing, uh, singing, you can run on for a long time, right? But sooner or later, God's going to cut you down if you know that song. And I hope this message this morning is a wake-up call to all of us, and especially any of us with persistent sin or unrepentant sin, or if we're minimizing sin in our life sooner or later god will cut you down not because he's trying to punish you but because he loves you and because sin is destructive and so at, at, at on one hand the plagues as we look at them are quite frightening perhaps to some of us but on the other hand they are an amazing word of hope to others of us I realize so often in this story, like when I read it, I always kind of focus in on Pharaoh and his hard heart. And this week as I was reading it, I, I found myself being like, wait a minute, there's a lot more to this that needs to be focused on. And I was reminded that as we read this, we are primarily should read this from the perspective of an oppressed people group uh, who are under the boot of Egypt. People who have watched their babies die. People who had their families split up. People who had their backs broken with hard labor from which there was no relief. People who are suffering with little or no hope that there can be any sort of good in their future. And all they could do was cry out to God. That's the only bit of power they had. And you know what? That was enough. That was enough because God heard them and God came and showed up. And how did God come and show up? Well, at the end of, at, at the end of this, when, uh, when in chapter 15, as the Israelites are standing on the far side of the Red Sea, and as the bodies of the Egyptians and their chariots are kind of washing up on the shore, and as the, the adrenaline of the Israelites slowly starts coming down, 
we read that they start breaking out into song, in worship. And as they start singing, what they, what they sing in the beginning is they sing, Yahweh is my strength and my might, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh, the Lord, is His name. See, in church, oftentimes we, we focus on and we remember that God is like the slain Passover lamb. That's what we're going to remember here in a few moments as we take communion. But the story of Exodus reminds us that our God is also a warrior God. That our God is the Lion of Judah. That our God is the table-flipping righteous King who looks around and when He sees injustice in the world, when He sees His people broken, when He sees people that are down and out, He's the one that rises up. that That His anger gets kindled when He looks around and sees the poor and the oppressed and the widow and the orphan and the immigrant. That our God is the one who who responds when the ears of people can't hear the cries of others. His ears do. The ten plagues show us that God will literally break down the fabric of creation and remake it to rescue His people. If you were to look at the plagues, they closely resemble Genesis 1 in so many ways. And what we see there is God will go to whatever lengths it takes to rescue His people. And so for those of us here or those of us in this world that are reading this, to the domestic abuse victim or the sex trafficked young boy or the exploited immigrant worker or the, Ga- or the Gazan refugee or the Israel-Israeli kidnap victim or the homeless Ukrainian or the bullied teenage girl, what the Exodus tells us is that our God roars at injustice that our God will go to whatever lengths it takes to, to, to stop and to win the situation, that God's anger simmers and quakes at blatant disregard for human life and against those that live comfortably at the expense of other people. The ten plagues is a message to those crying out, God has not forgotten you. God will not abandon you. God will bring justice to you one day. And I, like many of you, wonder, Lord, what's taking you so long sometimes? And I wonder if the, Isra- if the Israelites thought that same thing, same thing. But our God is a warrior for His people, and He is a warrior for righteousness, justice, and rescue. That's who He is. And so what we learn about God this morning, it's going to look different depending on where you stand and what's going on in your life and what's going on in my life. For some of us this morning, maybe we need to pray deep prayers of confession. Maybe we need to get on our knees and humble ourselves and beg for mercy at how hard-hearted and uncaring we have been. How we have lost sight of what truly matters when it comes to following Jesus. For how maybe we have become calloused to the pain of those of us around us and how we might need to humble ourselves in our relationships with each other and go and say, I am so sorry. And for others of us this morning, we may need to cry out to the Lion of Judah. We may need to be those people that beg once again, Yahweh, as you have done in the past, so once again do today. We may need to be the ones that need to worship God as the defender of orphans, as widows, as the rescuer and deliverer that He is. And pray that God would help us to leverage our strength on behalf of those who don't have any. So however however we need to respond, that's between you and the Lord this morning. But friends, there is good news. And the thieves on the cross give us the picture of that good news. They give us a picture of the possibilities before us. On one side of Jesus, we see the thief who mocked and refused and remained hard-hearted about who Jesus was all the way to the very end. And on the other side, that in his dying moments, literally his last moments, he humbled himself before God and was saved. Because, see, God never excuses our sin, but he's always willing to pardon it. He's always willing to forgive it. He's always willing to take whatever 
whatever little bit of humility and grace and mercy that we give to him and multiply that in our lives. God is the Lion of Judah, but he is the Lamb who was slain. And his mercy is great and greatly to be praised. I truly believe that if Pharaoh had stopped and repented, that all of this would have gone away. There is hope. What I'm trying to say is that there is hope for the abused, but there is also hope for the abuser too. That God, well, God can be your God too. And so today we have an opportunity to get right if we'll take it with God. And I just want to encourage us to not miss it. Here before God and here with each other. As Hebrews 3 says, Today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. But friends, let us come to the one who is willing to forgive. Let us come to the Lion of Judah, and let's come to the Lamb who was slain. Let's pray.